Good morning, church. Wherever you're at, would you stand with us? Would you clap? Let's give them praise this morning. Come on. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run full cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Yes, I do. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. Yeah, my praise belongs to you forever. Oh, this is my testimony from death to life. Cause Gates rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Come on, get your hands up. Lift your voice. Let's give him the praise he deserves today. Come on. Come together, sons and daughters. Bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God, He'll finish what He started. Yes, our God, He'll finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Oh, oh, oh. oh, oh. oh. dead and you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead and you're not done. No, no. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead and you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead and you're not done, the greater things is here to come. Oh, I believe. Yeah. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony, now I'm alive. This is my testimony, from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story, I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony, this is my testimony. testimony from I can't hear you, come on I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified this is my testimony come on, sing it again this is my testimony from cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Amen. 
Amen. Church, this morning we want to um, just engage in worship in a different way. There have been some interesting things that have happened over the week. And um, I think that praise and worship brings us unity. And I don't know about you. I don't know where you're at at home. I don't know what you're feeling. Um, I think often what we end up experiencing is a lot of what the enemy's ploy is to make us forget his promise. To make us forget who he is and what he's doing. What he continues to do. So this morning as we enter into this, I just ask that whatever it is that you're holding in your hands, whether it's politics, whether it's frustration, whether it's disappointment, whether it's joy. Because joy can be replaced with even more joy. He takes us from glory to glory to glory. And this morning we want to give him that type of praise. That God, you are capable of all things. We trust you. And because we trust you, we worship you with all of our hearts. And so I just want every single one of us, if you're willing, if you're able, to sing this out. I know you know it. So let's sing it as loud as we can. Come on. darkness, my God, I don't think we're done singing it again, yeah, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, oh, tell them, yeah, way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. You are here. Touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here. Healing every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you. Yeah, I worship you, and you are way better. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Come on, church, sing it out, yeah. Way maker, miracle worker, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Sing it again, yeah. Way maker, miracle worker, light. 
shine in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We make a miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is, that is, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is. your promises you keep all your promises in every situation God in every situation you are still holy we give you praise we give you praise yeah even when I don't see it you're working come on even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't. You never stop. Come on, sing it again. Sing it with all your heart. Even when, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you never stop. You never stop, you never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you never stop, sing it again with all your heart, yeah, yeah, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop, no, even when I don't see it, you're working, even when I don't feel it, you're working, never stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop, yeah, we make a miracle work, a promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, yeah. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. 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 Even when missing vision, that is who you are. That is who you are. When hatred rises, and that is who you are. That is who you are. He is capable of everything. His love is wiped as clean. His sacrifice has brought us joy in every situation, in every situation. Come on. And that is who you are. Come on, that is, I can't hear you, that is who you are, that is who you are, come on, that is who you are, 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 yeah, yeah, even when I don't see it, you work. Even when I don't feel it, 
you work it. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, Come on, lift your voice today. Never stop working. Never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. Never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, you never stop. We make miracle work, promise keeper. My God, that is who you are. Yeah, they make miracle worker. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Tell him that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are, and that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are, that is who you are. Jesus, we thank you that you're protecting, that you love us so much that you're willing to intercede in any situation to bring light to circumstances. That where there's ignorance, you bring wisdom. That where our steps are misguided, you create a path. That you go before us. That you stand way ahead the distance, that you call us to something greater. God, we thank you so much that you are who you say you are. We love you, we thank you, and we ask that in this last song of worship, that our hearts would be lifted to you, that our hearts would be open to you, and that we would know not only that you are the one that protects but you're the one that welcomes us as well.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our defender, our protector, our provider. Lord, I pray that you would carry us from one season to the next. We keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord. We love you and praise you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, as you already know by now, it is vision month and i'm excited about a lot of the stuff that's going on but we've been building a foundation because uh, no one can build a building on a foundation that's not solid and so we want to build a foundation here at this church of why are we going to be doing the things that we're doing why are we um talking about making changes why are we heading in new directions and um one of the things i'm really excited about i'll just give you guys a sneak peek okay We are going to be doing a midweek service with a completely different format, with a lot of different opportunities. Yeah, it's going to be incredible, and I'm really excited about it. So why are we doing this stuff? Well, we have to get the foundation right first. So last week, we talked about how we need to orient our hearts. We have to have a heart for God and a heart for people. If we're coming here just to serve ourselves or just to fix ourselves, although that's sometimes where it starts and that's okay, but if we're coming here just for ourselves, we're going to get introspective and we're going to get self-centered and it's not going to do well. But if we can keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, If we can start living outward towards others, then we're going to be fulfilled. So it starts with our heart. We talked about that last week. This week, I want to start with a serious question. How many people in the beginning of 2020 desired to lose some weight? Maybe you don't have to raise your hand, okay, because it's probably all of us. (laughs) How many people desired to lose some weight, maybe set a goal, maybe said, I'm going to do this by this time or this by that time? And then what happened? Next question. How many people felt it difficult to find the time or the energy to actually lose the weight? Or the discipline in a, in a, in a chance of diet? I mean, you don't have to raise your hands because I know that we're all, some of us at least, maybe some of you had some great success in this area, and I applaud you. And if you did, you, then what I'm going to talk about today is going to resonate with you because um, there is a connection that needs to be made between our heart and our body, our lifestyle. See, we want to make changes. We intend to make changes. We intend to be better, but we rarely have the habits and the lifestyle to adapt to those intentions. Our hearts can't really be fulfilled if our lives are already full. What do I mean by that? It means that the things that really matter to us, the things that we want to do, the things that we talked about last week about having a renewed heart, and I want to be on, pa- I want to be on uh, purpose and on mission, and, and I want to have a passion for things. I want to have a full, fulfilled heart. I can't do that if my lifestyle is already full of other things. We'll never be able to chase after the things of God as long as we're chasing the things of the world. That's why Jesus said, do not love the world or the things in the world. But seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. Look at it, Matthew 26, uh, verse 40. This is a story of the Garden of Gethsemane. It's the night before, it's the night Jesus was betrayed, and he gets to the garden, and they're there, and he says, hey, you guys keep watch. I'm going to go on and pray. You guys know this story, right? Some of you. Then he returned. If you don't, read Matthew. You know, if, if, if sometimes I say, hey, you guys know this story, and you're like, oh, I don't know that story. You say, don't make me feel bad by not knowing that story. Well, there's a way to know the story, and it's just to read it. We need to be a church that's reading our Bibles, spending time in prayer. Matthew 26, it says, Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. He says, The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's become common language in our lexicon, right? People know that the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. What does he mean? 
It means your heart's in the right place, but you couldn't, your body couldn't fulfill it. Your, your body couldn't do, your lifestyle couldn't follow through with what your heart intended. The disciples, of course, their hearts were in the right place. They were following Jesus. By this time, they had been tested. They had proven it. They had been, you know, rejected. They had been in scuffles. They had seen miracles. I mean, their hearts were in the right place. So what happened? They were used to something different. They were used to sleeping when they got tired. They were used to um, the fact that when Jesus went to pray, nothing really monumental ever happened. Not ever, but he was always going off to pray. I mean, when he prayed, stuff happened, don't get me wrong. But Jesus would go off to pray, and they'd be sitting in the boat. He'd go off to pray, and they'd be sitting by the fire. They'd go off to pray, and they'd, he'd go off to pray, and they'd go fishing, because Jesus was always praying. And so what are they thinking? Well, normal life. I'm tired. I'm just going to go to sleep. I don't have an expectation that something's going to be different. They were numbed by the mundane and by the ordinary, so they weren't prepared for the extraordinary. And a lot of times when we get numbed by life, we can't be passionate about eternal life because we get tired. We get used to things. We come here every Sunday and have an opportunity to worship, an opportunity to serve, an opportunity to teach in children's. All of you children's workers, thank you so much. You don't even know some, well, maybe you do and that's why you do it, but, but the things that you are investing into those kids' lives will have an eternal impact. We did a thing in our leadership team and said how many people came to faith uh, when they were kids, and it was almost everybody. It's such an overwhelming majority because the things that are implanted at a young age, they have sticking power. And so the opportunity that we have in children's ministry to share the gospel, to be a light, to be someone who loves these kids is incalculable. But what happens? We get used to it, and it gets mundane, and we lose our passion. And so like we talked about last week, we have to seek out the Lord and renew our hearts. But then when our hearts are renewed, we have to orient our lifestyle, the way that we live, so that we can be ready to grab hold of the eternal things of God. So when Jesus says, hey, keep watch for one hour, we say, I can do that. I can avail myself for that. I can make sure that I stay awake in this time because I know that it's important. You see, we have to change our habits and our behaviors and our lifestyles if we want to pursue the passion that God has put in our hearts. So it starts with having our heart right, but we can't just have our heart right. We have to get our lives right. And so last week, the title of the message was Orient, Reorienting Our Hearts. Today, it's Reorienting Our Lifestyle. Now, I'm not talking about um, you know, we've talked about this before. This is important to, to get rid of sin in your life and to, to, to drop some of the things that are in areas of bondage and areas of um, dominion that the enemy has in your life. Things that you have, what we call besetting sins, things that have been holding you back. What we're talking about today is, is not necessarily dealing with that sin, but rearranging the way that we live. Because it's not just sin that's going to hold you back. It's going to be the lifestyle, the habits, and the hang-ups that we live into. And this is what is loving the things of the world. It's that I would rather watch a movie than read my Bible. There's a, there's a change that needs to happen. I would rather watch my friends fight on social media than go pray for my friends in real life. See what I'm saying? we got to change the way that we live. So we were designed to be different. We were designed to be salt and light. What did Jesus say? How good is salt if it loses its saltiness? It's the whole point. And so if we're supposed to be salt and light, we're supposed to be a testimony. How good is it if we're not being a testimony? And how can we be a testimony if our lifestyle looks like every other person's lifestyle? So let me ask you this question. How different does your life look than everyone around you? I ask myself this question. And if the answer is not very much, then we're missing something. We're missing something as a church. And before we head in to all of the things that God has for us, we have to be able to, to reconcile and reckon with the fact that we're missing something and we need to reorient the way that we live so that we can grab hold of it. We have to reorient the structures of our lives to follow the passions of our hearts. And as a church, we're going to be making some changes to the structures of church 
We do not anticipate that making a change to the structures of the way that we do church is going to create passion in our hearts. However, we know that as God gives us passion and purpose, there are things that need to change to be able to better facilitate the passions that he's put on our hearts. And in the same way, in your own life, you can't just, this is why just starting a new diet and making some restrictions on your food and and doing something with your, uh, the gym is going to fail because you guys know this, unless it's something that's really in there, deep, and you're hungry for it. This is why our prayer team has been praying for two years. We want hungry people. And God has been answering that prayer because I know you guys are hungry people. But we have to have something hungry and deep and driving And then we change the structures and the things that are hindering us, and we can actually walk into it. That's what we need to do as a church. That's what we need to do in our own lives. I'm going to have a little demonstration. Freeman, come on up here. Let's give a round of applause to Freeman. It's hard being a pastor's kid sometimes, you know. I call him my perpetual prop. Come on up here, buddy. So remember last week, Freeman, are you smiling? Come on, you got a bigger smile than that. Oh, look at that. I win some. Okay, so last week, Freeman represented uh, a changed heart that was on fire for the things of God. Because remember, he was over here, and he was at first, he was uh, consumed with the things of the world, and that was a problem. And then he was consumed with his own um, self-pity uh, and, and depression and hurt and trauma and all these other things that were a problem. But eventually, he got to a place where he could stand right, and he could receive the things of the Lord, and so his heart was on fire for God. And your heart's on fire for God, isn't it? At one point, he said he wanted to be a pastor, right? Now he wants to be an NFL player, but I'm hoping that maybe that'll come around. You could do both. You would be the chaplain of the team. Okay. So now he is a, um, Juliet didn't want to, she's like, well, I don't always want to be the bad person. Because remember last thing, she represented the things of the world last week. So I said, okay, I'll do it. It's probably more accurate anyway, because she's so pure. I mean, so am I, but I have faults, okay? So I'm going to represent your lifestyle. <laughs> I'm representing my own lifestyle right now. Okay, so Freeman, come on down here. Now, Freeman is a heart that's on fire for God. And turn around, Freeman. They don't want to see your back. They want to see your beautiful face. Tell me if you can, if you can resonate with this. My, my, in my mind, I think I want to do something. I read something in the scripture, or I heard someone's testimony, and that makes me want to do something differently. And because I've been seeking the Lord and ready to receive he has for me, my heart is on fire for him. And yet, at the same time, I haven't changed anything about the way I live. I'm sitting at home, and I'm watching Netflix, and I'm eating Cheetos. Do you see how hard that was for me just to sit down? And I'm thinking, you know what? I want to uh, start giving more of my financial resources to the church. The Lord has blessed me. I want to be obedient. I want to be a blessing. I want to live generously because God loves a cheerful giver and I love that God loves me and so that's what I'm going to do. And my heart gets excited about it because uh, I'm, I'm passionate about everything that's uh, going on in ministry and so I decide that um, I want to go get an offering envelope. Okay? Uh, so Freeman, go get me an offering envelope. I didn't change anything about the way I'm living. I still have a lot of debt. I still am overspending the blessing of the Lord in my life. And I'm not quite ready to be able to make that. And so I watch the the kids on TV, you know, the ones that are are really hungry. And they they look mal, uh, they have malnutrition. And I want to do something about it. But I haven't made any change in my life. And so... I think, well, you know what, I'm going to take a step in the right direction. I'm going to, I'm going to save a little bit of money, and uh, I'm going to, to finally make a donation. Okay, and so I, I save $50. Okay, now Freeman, go get me that offering envelope. See, I'm not there all the way, because I'm still holding something back. I still haven't gone through my entire budget and to see how I can live my life completely differently, how I can change the way that, that I, I uh, eat out or the way that I buy Starbucks coffee at $5 a piece or anything like that. All I've done is taken one little step, and it's a step in the right direction, and those are the steps that we need to take. But until I'm ready to lay down everything and completely reorient my life, I'm never going to be able to get all the way to where God wants me to be. 
So poor little Freeman and his great heart is never going to be satisfied. No, I'm just kidding. Give him a round of applause. Let him sit down. So what are the changes that we need to make in our life to pursue the things that God's put on our hearts? What happens is if I'm here and I'm tethered to Freeman and and my body is stuck in one place and my lifestyle is stuck in one place, but my heart wants to fly, it wants to go places, what do we have? We have a stalemate. We're stuck. And I really think that too many Christians have a stalemate in their life. My heart is willing, but my body's not ready. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We might want to do something, but we aren't ready to. It's like being liquid in investments. You guys know the term liquid? It means like, uh, you know, I really wanted to invest in Tesla 10 years ago. If you invested $5,800 in Tesla 10 years ago, you'd be a millionaire now. I think that's the number I read. A little bit of money to a lot of money. And at the time, you know, hypothetically speaking, I didn't know anything about it, but this is hypothetically speaking, I really wanted to invest in Tesla, but I wasn't liquid in my investments. It means I didn't have any cash. Why? Because I had all my stuff in my new car and in my house and in whatever else I put it in, my Star Wars Lego collection. Those are, good. Those are expensive. And so I, I wasn't liquid. I couldn't do what I wanted to do, and so I missed an opportunity. And so many of us are orienting our lives that way to where I say, I see this opportunity, and man, this could bear some real fruit. In 10 years from now, I could have led 100 people to the Lord, maybe 1,000. I could have made a change in someone's life. I could have had an impact. But I wasn't liquid with my time. I wasn't liquid with my heart. I wasn't liquid in the way that I lived my life. I couldn't flow. I couldn't move. I couldn't be available for people. Or I didn't want to be. I really believe that too many Christians have a stalemate between their intentions and their reality. I really want to. I intend to. I'm planning to. But I just can't for whatever reason, so I won't. And we go on year after year trying to facilitate and foster some passion in our heart. And we go to the worship events. And we go to the small groups. And we go to the different things looking for something to inspire us and to make a change. And we keep needing to be refilled and topped off. And that's okay because we're going to anyways. But we keep getting refilled and refilled and refilled. But we're not driving down the road. We're not going forward into the things of God. Because we got a stalemate between our intentions and our reality. I want to get back into the scripture here. In Hebrews chapter uh, 10 and 11... We see these examples of faith in chapter 11 and then in 12. The writer goes on talking about how we need to keep on pursuing God, that we need to welcome the Lord's discipline because the discipline of the Lord is, don't read that just yet, but the discipline of the Lord is difficult and we need to welcome it because this is part and parcel of having our faith in the Lord. And we are, we're in this cloud of witnesses. We have all of these people that is examples that we can look to. And so it's just all about faith. And all about how we need to be um, people of faith and pursue faith like, like, pursue God like these people of faith did. And then it dropped this really interesting little flashback to Esau. And I'm going to give a little backstory about the scripture that we're going to read. So, uh, how many people know the name Esau? You know, I always felt bad for Esau because, he, first of all, he's got a bad name. You know, it makes me think of like a, a donkey or something. It's Esau. And so I was like, Jacob's a better name than Esau. Um, so I feel bad for Esau, but I also feel bad because he made a huge blunder. So the thing about Esau was Esau was the, the oldest son of Isaac, and he was the one who was going to inherit the birthright, the blessing of Isaac, and the nation of Israel was going to be through him. And he had a lot of stuff going for him, but he was also a hunter, and he had a certain lifestyle that he liked to live. And Esau was used to uh, being the oldest. Do you guys have an older sibling? Is anybody in here the oldest sibling? Okay, so you guys know that the oldest sibling is a little bit bossy, right? I mean, no offense. I'm the youngest, so I get to say that. I've experienced it. The old, maybe if they're not bossy, you kind of just have a sense of confidence that sometimes younger siblings don't have because you're used to kind of going out, and of course I'm, I'm stereotyping, painting with a broad brush. It's not true of everybody. But I think a little bit, some of the times, older siblings have a slight air of superiority because I'm used to having these kids 
under me, do what I want them to do. And so Esau is living in his life in a way where he gratifies his desires. He comes in, he goes for a hunt. This is the story. He goes on a hunt, he comes back, he's famished. He says, I need some soup. Like, has anybody got a bowl of soup for me? And I can just see Jacob over there. Well, Esau, let's talk about that for a minute. What are you willing to do for a bowl of soup? And they make an exchange, and and Jacob says, if you give me your birthright, the blessing that you have uh, as the son of, the oldest son of Isaac, then I will give you a bowl of soup. And so they make a trade, and we look back and we think, what was he thinking? But when you start thinking about the dynamic in real terms, you think, well, he's used to talking to Jacob, his younger brother, and getting what he wants. I mean, what, could he possibly have been serious? Maybe he was. So it, it was either the fact that he was so used to being self-indulgent that he had to have it at all costs, or he was so used to having a certain kind of relationship with his brother that he was dismissive and nothing really mattered to where it wasn't, he wasn't taking it seriously. Either way, it was the way that he lived his life that made him miss the opportunity of what was to come. Because he didn't have it now. Just like the people of faith in chapter 11 that Paul talks about, they didn't have the thing that they had now, and it's hard sometimes to stay faithful when I don't have it now. It's like, what's my inheritance worth now? I'm hungry now. Dad's not going to die for a long time, so give me the bowl of soup. Then we do that in our life. I'm used to living a certain way, so anything that has to do with what's to come can wait because I want to gratify my desires now. I want to live into the way that I live now. And so what does it say here then in Hebrews 12, 14 through 17? Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. First of all, that's a whole other message. But when you go on uh, Facebook later today, just read that scripture first. Every effort to live at peace. Okay. And everyone, and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So he's given some instructions here. See to it that no one is sexually immoral. It's difficult in our society because we're so saturated with sexuality everywhere you go. Everything is about sex. We even, we've even used the word, you know, like, oh, those things are sexy. And we're even talking about it with our kids. Like, what does that say? Everything's about sex, but that's a whole other message too. Man, there's so much good stuff here in the Bible. Let's just read it more. All right. So he says, see to it that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, now, they, they might have known this because they were, they were Hebrews and they were Jews and they understood all the stories that went around it. But maybe we don't know this. But afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. You see, his heart was in the right place. He wanted the inheritance. He wanted to have the blessing of his father and the blessing of the Lord. But his lifestyle got in the way. And so he comes with tears saying, why is this happening to me? Now the good news is that in our own lives, God's mercies are new every morning. And he's faithful even when we're not faithful. And so he'll continue to bless us as we come to him. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And yet at the same time, we can do exactly what it says here. We can fall short of the grace of God. We can put ourselves in a position to not receive the grace of God because we're not living in a way to allow his grace to fully manifest in our lives. Is this making sense? So here's some questions here. As we're almost finished, I want us to have a time of reflecting. The Bible tells us, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but in sober judgment. So let's think about ourselves as a church right now. How has gratifying your immediate desire kept you from what you want to do and be in Christ? Where has your, in other words, where has your spirit been willing, but your flesh has been weak? 
How many people would like to experience the joy of leading someone to Christ? That's a, you can raise your hands on that one if you want. The joy of leading someone to Christ. When, when you see them pray that prayer, and something happens, sometimes in tears, sometimes in a smile that can't be contained, and you know in your spirit that something is happening in their spirit, the same transformation that you experienced at some point in your life, something is new, something has shifted. There's nothing better in the world. Now the next question, you don't have to raise your hands for this one. How many people have actually led someone to Christ this last year? In the last five years? In the last 10 years? I believe with all my heart that we want to be people who are a salt and light and leading people to the Lord, sharing our testimony. But something is in the way. We're missing something. And when our lifestyle isn't aligned with our purpose, we miss out on the opportunities from God. And we have so many people and so many believers who are crying out to the Lord like Esau cried out and saying, why don't you do this? My heart's in the right place. Why don't you do this? I love you. Why isn't this happening? We're falling short of the grace because we haven't made any changes in our lifestyle to grab hold of the things that God wants for us. So as a church, our vision is transformation together. That means that we want to be changed into the likeness of Christ. We want to be renewed. We want to be holy. We want to be righteous people. That's what God has for us. And we do that in the context of togetherness. We can do that online together. We can do that in person together. We can do that in small groups together. Like it says in Hebrews 10, I believe, do not neglect meeting uh, together as is the habit of some. But meet together to, why, to encourage one another. Which means that we need to be together and we need to encourage each other so that we can have transformation in our lives. That's the vision of the church. And the mission, the way that we do that, the, way, the work that we have to do to realize that vision is to love God, love others, and make disciples. It's really simple. We don't need a really complex uh, roadmap. It's, it's that simple. But as our lifestyle of allowing us and preparing us to be able to love God, love others, and make disciples. See, God created us to be devoted. God created us to live differently. We're citizens of heaven. We're not supposed to be fighting each other on social media. <laughs> don't get me started on that. We're not supposed to get in bed with political movements, and parties. We have a completely different aisle. They say, what side of the aisle are you on? Oh, it's on the other side of the aisle. We have a completely different aisle. This is why it's called the way. The way. The truth. And the light. And what did, God, what did Jesus say? My kingdom is not of this world. He's prepared a heavenly kingdom. So we ought to look different than everybody else squabbling over the earthly kingdoms. This isn't our territory. We're just passing through. And so what are we doing? We spend so much time and energy trying to right the broken kingdoms of this world instead of establishing the holy, perfect kingdom of God. And if we as Christians spent half the time, half the energy, 10% of the energy that we spend arguing and full of fear and full of frustration and tit for tat, and all of this stuff that's going on, if we spend a fraction of that time loving our neighbors, praying for every single person on our street, walking in the neighborhood and getting to know them, meeting their needs, always ready, always prepared to give a reason for the hope that we have in Christ, we wouldn't have these problems that we're dealing with in the first place, or at least not to the extent that we do. We have the answer and the answer is not to try to fix the kingdoms of this world. It's to invite the kingdom of God to come in and permeate everything that we do. And if we want to live like that, we're going to have to make some changes. So in Hebrews chapter 12, we're jumping back a few verses. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, meaning so many great examples of faith, faith, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out before us. 
Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. The writer is saying what our rule three of our three rules to live by, he's saying, keep on pursuing. Keep on pursuing. We have examples of how to live, of how to pursue God. So keep on pursuing. Don't grow weary. Don't grow heart. And what we're talking about this month is a few weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, I, my timeline's all askew, but I talked about that scripture and we talked about the sin that so easily entangles. It says, cast that stuff off. But now we need to talk about running the race. And if I'm going to run a race and I'm going to win, I'm going to have to do some training. And that training and that equipping is going to require me to make some changes to my diet and to make some changes to my schedule and to make some changes to my priorities because winning their race is my priority. And I want us to be a church that has winning the race, winning people to Christ, sharing our faith, showing people a different way to live to be our first priority. I hope and I pray that you're with me on that. So here's a paramount question. How does God want you, and this is an us question, but how does God want you to reorient your life so that you can fulfill your purpose? And it's going to look so different for everybody, but here's some examples. Maybe it's blocking out some time in the morning or in the night to just seek him. And if you want help with that because you get... You know, you get dry, you say, well, I don't know where to start reading my Bible, or I try to pray and I just get distracted and I'm not sure how to do it. Uh, talk to me. Email me, text me, all my information's on the website, or just call me, meet me in the connection area. Because there's nothing more fulfilling than spending time with the Lord. David knew that. <clears throat> Maybe it's changing the way that you work. Or even what you do for work. You know, we, we, we put such a priority on work. I was talking to a guy the other day who was, and I, I told him for years, I said, listen, you're too consumed with your work, man. You know, I'm a hard worker, and I like to work. I actually enjoy work. You tell me, if you give me, you know, some work to do or something else, I'm probably going to choose the work. But I said, you're too fearful about it. He ended up losing his job. And he told me a few weeks ago, it's the best thing that ever happened to him. Because it changed the way that he, he uh, oriented his life. Now, I'm not saying you should quit your job. I'm just saying, what are the things that God is calling you to? That maybe it's a change in perspective. To have a different perspective about the way that you work. So instead of looking at your work as this horrible ball and chain, you could look at your work as a mission field. That God has given you, whoever your coworkers are, as a captive audience to see the light of Christ living through you. Maybe it means cutting back on extra activities. Can't do anything or go anywhere or come to church because we've got too many sports and different things going on. Maybe it means canceling your Netflix account. <laughs> Don't get crazy, come on. <laughs> or selling your PlayStation. Maybe it means getting in shape so that you can feel better and live better and have more energy. You know, I used to think that being in shape was just about vanity and looking good. And as I'm getting older, I'm realizing, no, it's like about feeling good. <laughs> My knees hurt. Maybe it is confessing that hidden sin that you have so that you can get over it. Getting yourself surrounded by some people who can support you. I don't know what it is, but the point is we're missing something. If we can't, every single person here who's put their faith in Jesus Christ and who loves the Lord, if we can't say that we've led anyone to the Lord in the last five years, we are missing something. The good news is we can and we will make a change. And if our hearts are in the right place, we need to structure our lives in the right way. And this church as a whole, as a collective, we're in the same boat as you are individually. It's vision month, and we're going to be getting to the specifics. We're building a foundation. We're building the levels. I'm excited next week to hear from Bishop Emeritus Matt Thomas, who's going to walk us through some additional stuff that's going to be uh, just so important to our vision. But as a church, we have to ask ourselves these questions. How does God want us to live into our vision of transformation together? 
to keep on pursuing, to get past the surface, to make sure that no one does life alone? How are we going to be together? Those are hard questions to answer in the midst of a global pandemic. How are we going to experience and offer real transformation? See, it starts with our hearts, but it moves to the way that we live, and it's realized in, we, what, in what we do from that place. And this is the interesting thing is I know that people are, are thinking, well, when are you going to get to it? When are you going to tell us what we're actually going to do at our midweek service? And, and the other thing that I've been hinting at but I haven't talked about. See, that's all the what are we going to do about it. See, we realize where our heart's been at. We realize our intention as we change our heart, reorient the structures of our lives, and then we can focus on what we're going to do. I can tell you this, we are going to make some changes because I'm tired of missing something. I'm tired of missing the people in our neighborhoods who desperately need Christ. I'm tired of, of telling people that the answer is Jesus and then not giving them the answer. To say the way that we can heal this land and bring unity and, and division and clarity is by allowing God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, to change people's hearts and minds and say, that is the way, and then not change anything about the way that we live to make that a reality. And so I'm asking you, everybody who's participating online, everybody who's here, everybody who might watch this later, I want to be a church that's changing the way that we live so that we can change the lives of others. And I want to ask you to make a commitment in 2021 to be focused in, not on all the other stuff. I, don't, I can't, I, we can't have another year that's just one year of perpetual complaints. We have work to do. We have hope to share. We have the answer. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's transformation together and I want to do it with you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you know our hearts. Lord, in our minds, we are saying that we're ready for something completely familiar but entirely different. Lord, we have been touched and transformed by you over the last few years. But we're still missing something, Lord. And wherever our mind makes a decision, but our heart's not already there, Lord, I ask that you would give us passion in our hearts. That you would fill us with a hunger for you. A hunger for your will. A hunger for your people. That's step one. And Lord, I pray that you would then, by your grace, and by your conviction, and by your discipline, and by your love, empower us to make the changes in our life that we need to make so that we can follow the passions of our hearts. And finally, Lord, as a church, I pray that you would give us wisdom and that you would give us insight. Lord, I pray that this would not be the year where it's, uh, well, the leadership team has been talking about, but it would be the year where every single person in this church is on the leadership team because we're all leading people to Christ. Lord, I pray that this would be the year that every single person in this church is on the worship team because our lives are an act of worship. <laughs> Lord, I'm excited about what you're going to do. I'm grateful for what you've already done. We receive your blessing. We receive your grace. And we love you for it, Lord. We give you all the praise and glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.